April 11th, 1993, Easter Sunday. Most of America is getting ready to attend church services or spend time with family. Something entirely different is occurring in Southern Ohio. The largest prison riot in Ohio history is jumping off. It would turn into an 11 day siege, like a castle in medieval times waiting out the enemy. 10 would be dead and the Southern Ohio area would be shocked. Let's take a look at the Lucasville prison riot. Lucasville, Ohio is a small town and is labeled as a census designated place. Located in Scioto County in Southern Ohio, 1,655 people live in Lucasville, Ohio. The county seat, Portsmouth, is about 10 miles to the south on the banks of the Ohio River. The area is named after Robert Lucas, a hero from the War of 1812. Southern Ohio Correctional Facility is the setting of this unfortunate incident. As with most prison riots, there is always a buildup to the incident, often with multiple factors involved. Tensions slowly began to rise in 1990 after a teacher at the prison was murdered. She was followed into the restroom by an inmate and her throat was slashed. The murderer, Eddie Vaughn, was her own aide in the classroom. The husband of the victim sued the state of Ohio for wrongful death and won because appropriate security measures were not in place to protect staff. This put pressure on the Ohio DRC administration to create a more secure, and in the offender's eyes, a more restrictive environment. The early 1990s was a time of high crime in the country. This led to prison overcrowding all over the nation. In 2019, the prison was operating at a population of 1,292. The population at the prison at the time of the riot was over 2,000. This led to inmates being double bunked. If this were a forest fire, the overcrowding and the increased restrictions on inmates would be the dry summer brush. But there still would need to be a spark to ignite the whole thing. The spark would come from a group of Muslim inmates who were refusing to take a tuberculosis test because it contained products that were against their religion. Some people say this claim is over exaggerated, but it was used as a point of negotiation during the riot. The riot would begin as the offenders were coming off the prison yard. A fight would break out in cell block L. A CO's keys were taken from him and all the cells were opened on the block. The five correction officers on the unit were subdued and taken hostage. The inmates chanted, we have the keys in a loud and emotional manner. Almost immediately, five inmates that were identified as snitches were dispatched. Two of them were stabbed, one over 20 times. Another inmate was strangled with an extension cord. Following the killing of the five, their bodies were placed in the prison yard. While the offenders didn't have firearms, they did take the officer's batons after taking over the unit. Within the first few hours, 12 guards were under the control of over 400 inmates, most of which had been beaten badly by the rioters. That same evening, three officers were released by offenders due to their extensive injuries. A spokeswoman for the Ohio Department of Rehabilitation and Correction said of the dead inmates, they suffered extensive injuries. I think it's probably pretty obvious who killed them. Our staff wouldn't do that. By her answer, there appears to be questions at that time surrounding whether staff had killed the inmates. After the first day, the only other information regarding the riot provided by authorities was a group of inmates started a fight and a group of correctional officers responded. At that time, L Block was housing 761 inmates, but not all had been involved. Typically, the prison was staffed by 130 correctional officers, but only 80 were on shift. After day one, the prison began to buzz with more law enforcement and prison teams on standby outside the prison. Day two would begin and officials were still trying to get a grasp on the situation. The yards were cleared by staff and placed in K block. Tuesday, April 13th. The next morning, all water and electricity was turned off. The riot could only last so long without these necessities. Another slain inmate was placed in the yard. It appears on the second day, there wasn't much progress made by prison staff on what to do. This wasn't ending anytime soon. Wednesday, April 14th. A police helicopter patrolling the area crashes with three people suffering injuries. A sheet is hung outside the windows of L Block, threatening to kill a hostage if demands aren't met. Various accounts say that demands were relayed via telephone, which included more programming and additional visitation privileges. At this time, inmates did not feel prison authorities were taking them seriously. Thursday, April 15th, things would start to spiral out of control. Robert R. Vallandingham, a correctional officer, was killed and his body was placed in the prison yard. It appears that the leaders of the riot wanted to let everyone know that they were serious. One negotiator for the state said, we are getting positive feedback. There is a feeling of mutual respect. Various reports were also emerging that the inmates wanted the warden and most of the supervisors fired. Another officer was released by inmates on this day. 
Over the next few days, negotiations would drag on with limited success. Sunday, April 18th, Cleveland lawyer Nikki Schwartz, a prison advocate, was brought to aid the process. A 21-point agreement was signed by the warden, but this would not be the end. Throughout this time, food and water deliveries were being made to inmates. Again, a few days would pass with inmates weighing their options and negotiations continuing. Wednesday, April 21st. This would be the day it would end. After a meeting with Schwartz, an agreement was finally reached. At 3.56 p.m., inmates would begin to surrender, but there still would be more bloodshed. Two more inmates would be killed. At 10.40 p.m., the five remaining correctional officers were freed, and by 11.20 p.m., the last inmate would surrender. This would be the end of the prison siege. Now the analysis by the public would begin. Why did it have to go this far? Could the death of the correctional officer have been avoided? Before moving on, make sure you check out my other video on dangerous Ohio prisons by clicking the link above. The inmates would, in theory, have their demands met, but it would come with a cost. They attempted to negotiate into their terms that there would be no retaliation against the inmates, but the warden would not keep that promise. Other demands, such as reviewing complaints made about staff, accepting religious objections to medical procedures, and reviewing a law that required integration of prison cells were all honored at first. But according to the book, Lucasville, The Untold Story of a Prison Uprising, the state would later violate most of the agreements. The damage to the prison was estimated at $40 million, a ridiculous amount considering the prison cost just over $51 million when it was constructed in 1972. Although there are conflicting reports, authorities said that there was an unlikely alliance of prison gangs, gangster disciples, black Muslims, and the Aryan Brotherhood. Each of the leaders of the riots, known as the Lucasville Five, were alleged members of these gangs except for one. They would each be tried and convicted of murder. Bomani Shakur, Sadiq Abdullah Hassan, Jason Harry Robb, George W. Skatzes, Namir Abdul Mateen, all sit on death row in Ohio. Several of these men are known by their government name by the state of Ohio. Shakur is scheduled for execution in November 2023. A class action lawsuit was filed by the inmates at the prison due to the condition. The state of Ohio settled the lawsuit for $4.1 million and agreed to fix overcrowding and mismanagement issues. After entering the prison following the riot, the Dayton Daily News would write, The smell of burnt mattresses still lingers in the corridor leading to L Block. Beyond the iron bars, trash and debris line the walls. The mess of riot-scarred Southern Ohio Correctional Facility is evident in the corridor, but that doesn't really convey the human tragedy of the 11-day prison siege. A large, fresh flower arrangement in the prison's main hallway is a gentle reminder. Sent by the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the bouquet is a tribute to corrections officer Robert Vallandingham, one of 10 people to die in the standoff. This is another Chasing Crime Profile. Thanks for watching and see you next time.